brothers, we gather on this holy day of Easter, the last weekday that we celebrate in the Easter season. So let us together take a moment now to praise God for his mercy and compassion, who's seen us through all our trials and tribulations, who has been the center of our lives throughout these seven weeks of the Easter season. Let us proclaim the mercy of God. Hear me,
toward the end of the Easter season. As I said uh, yesterday, tomorrow uh, we, we celebrate for the vigil tomorrow, and uh, Sunday we celebrate the Feast of Pentecost, and thus comes to an end our Easter season, which has been going on for seven weeks. And if you wonder what seven weeks feels like, well then all you have to do is just think of the time that you've been <laughs> in, um, in uh, isolation. And uh, this is the protocol that we've got with Bob's in Manitoba, because seven weeks plus more when we began this whole thing during Lent. So, I've been spending an enormous amount of time talking with you about uh, the journeys of Paul as related to us by St. Luke in the Acts of the Apostles. Recall that Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke, but he, the, gospel, the, the Acts of the Apostles is ascribed to him as a, a kind of a second Gospel that he wrote. The first one being the um, Luke's uh, attempt to tell us about the life of Jesus uh, before the resurrection, and of course the Acts of the Apostles is chronicling the life of Jesus, risen from the dead, among the community, the faithful, and the birth of the church and all that. However, have you noticed that there's been an enormous amount of time devoted to St. Paul and his journeys? So yesterday we were, we were being given a, a narrative of, of somewhere in the middle of his third journey, these huge journeys that were, you know, thousands of kilometers, hundreds of kilometers anyway. And uh, so in this case, uh, we, we know from this week that we've seen Paul leave Ephesus, which is somewhat up in in Asia and leave Ephesus a very tearful goodbye with the people of Ephesus and especially with the, the priests, the people that were the leaders of the people in Ephesus, so uh, of the church in Ephesus. And so he uh, leaves them and, and goes around and ends up in Jerusalem <clears throat> where he is, um, where they, the Jews there who have, have it in for him big time, want to kill him, where they have him, ultimately he gets arrested. Now here's the thing, Paul being very clever, and remember, I was saying to you that, you know, the Lord gave you a, a mind to use, so use it. That, that's, that's one of the tools that you have for spreading the good news, for evangelizing, for telling people about your own faith, is your mind. And so you need to, you have a responsibility to make sure that you're able to be, you know, thoughtful and intelligent in your, in the expression of your faith as much as you are to be uh, able to do things practically. Um, so uh, what happens is Paul has... He finds his way out of a very tight situation where he gets the, the scribes, the, the uh, Sadducees and the Pharisees to fight with each other because uh, Paul spots a weakness in their approach. The Pharisees, of course, believe in the resurrection in general and the, the Sadducees do not. So he gets them to fight with each other. He claims to be a Pharisee and so the Pharisees see him as a member of their own team and, and they, they, but they also need to defend their belief in the resurrection. Not the resurrection of Jesus. Paul's very clever. He doesn't, he doesn't proclaim that just yet at this point. He simply says the resurrection. I believe in the resurrection of the body. And so, yeah. So he gets them to fight with each other. Any, in any case, it becomes a real problem in some ways, or maybe just a thorn in the side for the, the Roman governors, the people who are supposed, the Romans who are trying to keep the peace. And so the leader of the Roman cohort there uh, takes him in under arrest. And we, we find out that he's, today, is what's narrated as we, we zip through the end of the Acts of the Apostles, it's, it's more about uh, what's happening with, with Paul. Chapters 24 and 25, we're getting snippets so that they can, uh, we can get through this. But the, the essence of, of the story is that uh, the governor, Felix, now has Paul in his hands and has him in prison for two years. That's a long time. So Paul is in prison in uh, Caesarea uh, under, the, under the care of Felix, who is the governor, the Roman governor there, who answers directly to Caesar. And so it turns out that Felix was actually not such a bad guy. Um, the, 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 the governors of, 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 um, of the people of Israel, the Roman governors, were all, there was a lot of nepotism, they were all related in some way to Herod, one of the Herods. But in any case, Felix actually enjoys talking about religion and faith with Paul, as we know in the parts of the actual Apostles that are not related here. Um, he, he, would, he would call Paul and have him discuss, he was kind of fascinated by his, uh, he was intellectually fascinated by Paul's approach to faith. And he only became very uncomfortable when Paul would start to say, well, there's an implication to all this. The implication is that you have to live a good moral life. 
And at that point, Felix becomes very uncomfortable. In fact, at one point, he tries to bribe Paul to see if he can get Paul to fall away from his convictions, and of course, it doesn't work. In any case, at one point, Felix, uh, his reign as governor is over, and he's replaced by another one. His name is Portius Festus. So Festus uh, comes along, and it so happens that it's a tradition that the king, who, who is Jewish, King Agrippa, and his wife Bernice come through because it's traditional to pay <coughs> tribute to the new governor, and they come through. And Festus uh, says to, uh, to Agrippa, the king, he says, I have this guy in my custody. Now, unlike, unlike uh, Felix, who was more or less sympathetic in some ways with Paul, now Festus is not. Festus is more sympathetic with, with the Jews. And so he does hear them, but he tells the king that he invited the Jews to come and, and lay their case in court against Paul. So remember now, this is over two years now that Paul has been, um, this litigation has been going on a long time. And so they come and, and, and um, Festus tells the king that he, the charges that they want to lay against him um, are baffling to him. He thought it would be something else, something to do with the law. But instead, he says, it's just a squabble that they're having about their own faith and it's just an argument about words and something to do with this Jesus of Nazareth that Festus wants nothing to do with. And so, um, so Paul plays this. He plays pretty much, um, he, he, well, here's the thing. Remember I told you a little while ago that Paul's ultimate goal was to get to Rome. Whether he understood that fully or whether it was just his intuition, but we know that Paul ultimately wanted to end up in Rome. Why? Well, because just as he, he went to uh, Athens, which was the center of culture, for like, the, the high point of culture for the, the known world at that time, and he took a crack at trying to convince the, um, the elite, the thinkers of Athens, at the Areopagus, tried to convince them about the resurrection. Remember the whole story about he finds the statue of the unknown God and tries to convince them that that's actually the God of Israel. It didn't go so well. However, now he wants to get to Rome. Why? Because while Athens is the cultural center, Rome is actually the seat of power of the known world. So if the good news of salvation can get to Rome, well then it will go everywhere because Rome is the hub, Rome is the center. So Paul actually plays this out and, and when, um, so Festus says to him, the new governor says, well, shall I send you to Jerusalem so that the Jews can deal with you and, and try you according to their own laws? Paul says, well, I'm a Roman. I'm a Roman. And uh, I demand to be um, treated according to Roman law. And I have, even as an accused, I have the right to be heard by Caesar. And so, yeah, Festus is kind of stuck. He's got he's to deal with this. And so, essentially, then, Paul is, is told to, he's going to be held until he can be sent to Rome to face. And so, you see, through all these trials and tribulations, through all these three great journeys that Paul had, ultimately, it was, I would propose to you, that it was God's will that Paul would end up in Rome, ultimately. That that's really what God was trying to do. So, through all these crooked lines, and all these this way and that way, and up and down, and everything else, to get to Rome the whole point. And so, yeah, indeed, this is how it's working. So there's a, a couple of things there that I think are really important for us. And, and I think, especially, you know, especially with this new, um, these trials, I would say, that we, we would say that we're experiencing with the, this new normal, whatever that means and whatever that will be, that we're experiencing something radically different. And it's easy for us to sort of feel as though we're being tossed around in the waves of whatever. You know, we wait for the, the uh, provincial health uh, experts to tell us, you know, what we can do now. And so it, it's easy to sort of feel as though we're at the mercy of, of just whims and of faith. <clears throat> but, and, and, and you know what, actually that can add some pain to our lives if we stop and think, you know, look at us, woe is, woe is us. But what the story with Paul reminds us of is that, well, here's the bottom line, isn't it? Um, it's not about us. It's never about us. Not from my perspective. I mean, if you make it about us, then it's just like everybody else. But we are Christians. We are followers of the resurrected one. And, and with that,
that comes something else. It means that when we commit ourselves to that, and we did, when we commit ourselves to that, we, we commit ourselves to the idea that it is not about us, it's about God. It's about what God wants. And we are really issues. Now, it's not to say that we're not important. I'm not saying you're not important. And because to God, you are terribly important. What I'm saying is, is that it's a failure on our part as disciples to sort of end up saying, oh, woe is us. Who am I? You know? I, I? I would remind you that being a disciple of Jesus, none of us, neither Paul nor Peter, Peter today in today's gospel, you know, he's told, you're going to be led around by the nose. I mean, you're going to, as you get older, you're going to be told what to do, or you'll recognize that you're not going to be in charge of your own life. I will remind you that none of us are really promised a rose garden. That's never Crystal Gate. That's Crystal Gate. Had a little bit of an issue with the camera. So I would remind you that none of us are, are, are really promised a rose garden. We're not promised that we would suffer all that much more anyhow. But, but I think it's a mistake that we make. And it comes from our perspective that the universe is revolving around us and our problems are so significant that we tend to sort of see life as against us sometimes. But you and I both know the vagaries of fame and fortune, and the same is true of misfortune. Things just happen. And it's, it's not necessarily about you. It's just the way life goes. Now, if you want, you can magnify your pain by, by perceiving it as something that is especially meant for you. Well, that's entirely within your control. It really truly is. I think all of us do well if we try to remember that really, ultimately, it's not about us. It's really about God and God's will and what God is accomplishing in the world through us, us as instruments. But it's not really about us. If we make it about us, I guarantee you, you will make it more painful than it already is. You can deal with whatever it is that's painful that's happening in your life. We can all deal with this. What's, what's happening with the COVID virus. We can all deal with that. But if we make it about us, it becomes especially painful. And it's not necessary. It's not. We're challenged by the story of St. Paul and how his, these lines and his travels and these three great journeys and going to this place and that place and ending up in Rome. We're challenged by that to see the same thing as, as, as that as, as what's happening in our, our lives today. You have to understand, and you need to understand, that God is still working in this virus. That God's will is still being made. God is not making the virus happen to punish us. That's a really a very foolish perspective. No, instead, the, the virus is, is just simply is. It simply is. It's another thing that's alive in this world that is out there doing its thing, trying hard to survive in its own way, the way it knows, which is to infect other hosts, and that's how it exists. So it's just merely doing its thing to exist. However, at a greater level, at a higher level, God is operating in that. God's will is still being done. The thing to remember is this. It's all about what God wants. It's all about God. It's about God. God is God, I am not. If I maintain that perspective, then all the things that happen, whether they be joyous or whether they be sorrows, will only be those things, and they won't be magnified by our sense that, oh, woe is me. So, on this day, as we prepare for the Feast of Pentecost, which is happening this weekend, I recommend to you that you spend a little bit of time saying to God, I will, I will do the same, because I have the same tendencies, I have the same tendencies, why is this happening to me? Um, I would recommend that we all take some time to sort of uh, spend some quiet time and Allow ourselves to challenge ourselves and open yourself up to, um, to the Holy Spirit. Prepare some room for the Holy Spirit this weekend to say, come Holy Spirit, you know, recreate me, re, re, remake me, inform my mind, you know, secure my heart in the reality, the reality that God is God and I am not, in the truth that it's all about God and not about me. Help me, Holy Spirit, to come to understand that, to accept that, 
and to live my life as a disciple of Jesus, joyfully accepting the reality that God is God. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for your goodness we receive the bread we offer you. Fruit of the earth work with human hands will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for your goodness we have this wine to offer. Fruit of the vine, with the human hands, it will become our spiritual drink. Blessed be God forever. Lord God, we ask you to be pleased with us, and the sacrifice we offer you with humble and contrite hearts. Lord, wash away my iniquities, cleanse me of all my sins. Pray, my friends, that my sacrifice and yours will be acceptable to God the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and the glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. Amen. Look mercifully, O Lord, we pray, upon the sacrificial gifts of your people, so that they may become acceptable to you. Let the coming of the Holy Spirit cleanse our consciences. We ask this through Christ. Amen. Lord, be with you, and with your spirit, lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just. I do the end our salvation. Always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Child of God, through Christ our Lord. For after his resurrection he plainly appeared to all his disciples and was taken up to heaven in their sight that he might make us sharers in his divinity. Therefore, Sing together the unending hymn of your glory as they acclaim. Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna Saying, 
Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith, when we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, O Lord, until you come again. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly, we pray that partaking of the body and the blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church, spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis, our Pope, and Albert, our Bishop, and all the clergy. Remember our brothers and sisters who fall asleep in the hope of the resurrection, and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, Blessed Joseph, the spouse, with the blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, Saint Bernadette of Lourdes, Saint Boniface, Saint Paul of Tarsus, and with all the saints who please you throughout the ages, that we too may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life, and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Throw him with him in him, O God Almighty, Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. At the Savior's command, and for my divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil, and graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of the church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, you who live and reign forever and ever. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, grant us your peace. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, by the will of the Father and the work of the Holy Spirit, through your death, gave life to Free me by this, your most holy body and blood, from all my sins and from every evil. Keep me faithful always to your commandments, and never let me be parted from you. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed.
Once again, I offer to lead you in your prayer to communion by desire. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most blessed sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, come, at least spiritually, into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there, and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. And uh, I wanted to introduce you, if you didn't know it already, to this beautiful, traditional 12th century hymn that is done, uh, has been done in the church for, since then, 12th century, um, at Easter time. And since this is our really our last day of Easter together, uh, because we celebrate Pentecost beginning tomorrow, um, I would like to do it for you one more time. I, I hope you learned it. I hope you at least learned the melody. It's Regina Celli, the Queen of Heaven, traditionally done at Easter. It is primarily about Mary's joy at the fact of the resurrection, but also because Mary is the perfect disciple, is all of our joy. Regina Celi, letale, alleluia, qui ad si portare, alleluia, resurrexit si cutixit, alleluia, ora pro nobis Deum, alleluia. O Queen of Heaven, It's not just because we're told to do it. 
It's because we have to recognize that you and I and everybody else that you see is actually important, important, important enough to have been willed to exist by God. So, yeah, we are important, each of us, to God. But from the point of view of the kingdom and God's realm, it's really all about God. And we're there to know God, love God, serve God, and to spend eternity with God. That's why we exist. All right, so the Lord be with you. Bow your heads, pray for God's solemn blessing during this Easter season. May God, who by the resurrection of his only begotten Son, was pleased to confer on you the gift of, of, of redemption and of adoption, give you gladness by his blessing. Amen. May he, by whose redeeming work you've received the gift of everlasting freedom, make you heirs to an eternal inheritance. Amen. And may you, who have already risen with Christ in baptism through faith, by living in a right manner, on this earth, be united with him in the homeland in heaven. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in the peace of Christ. Alleluia. Alleluia.